It's a call that's telling me I'm here to serve. It's a need to make a difference in the world. 24 hours, day or night, these healing hands will make it right. Looking in their eyes, I know that I'm changing lives, changing lives, changing lives for the better, for the better, changing lives. And hi again, everyone. Jim Knox along with Candace Kruger, and we welcome you back to another episode of the Best Docs Network featuring some of the best doctors in the entire Dallas-Fort Worth area that, of course, Candace helped change people's lives. Absolutely. Like our first doctor, it's prostodontist Dr. David McFadden. I had started very early in my 20s to get a lot of dental work crowns. And then in my 30s, I realized it wasn't going to last forever. And this created some problems. Not only is it expensive, but it takes your time and it's uncomfortable. Implant treatment has really been a great technology for patients whose teeth have reached a point where they can't be restored. Teeth that reach that point either have broken off, have decayed, or are just so broken down that we can't use them anymore in the reconstruction process. In those patients who have reached that point, we recommend removal of the teeth and reconstruction with dental implants. Sue had been plagued by a, a lifetime of dental problems, including decay and tooth loss. She had reached a point where we did not feel comfortable saving any of her natural teeth, so we decided we'd uh, do a reconstruction for her with dental implants. My friend Kelly is in the dental educational field, so he's very meticulous and precise, so you always go to the person that's best suited to the job. And in this case, it was a prostodontist. Kelly said this was the only place to do it, and so this is where we did it. And he was right. Sue was referred by a very close friend of hers who is a dentist here in Dallas. I was honored to get that referral because they had researched her needs and visited many offices before deciding to come here. What they found in their search was that a lot of the other practices were heavy on sales and very light on education. What they liked about my approach was that I simply gave them their options and was able to show them similar cases so they could make their own decision. Dr. McFadden is very easy to talk to. He can take a joke, he's got a sense of humor, he's serious when he needs to be. He's very thorough both in the procedures and also letting you know what's going to happen and how he's doing it. Many times patients' dental situations have deteriorated to the point where their whole mouth needs to be treated. Many people can't afford that, so we try to stage their treatment in a way that we have good stopping points along the way so they can regroup and plan for the future. Vincent's severe back pain kept him from playing the game he loved, soccer. That is until he met Dr. Robert Miles. To find out more about Vincent's story and other life-changing stories, log on to BestDocsNetwork.com. I was 335 pounds. I had a uh, sleep apnea. Um, I had high blood pressure. My back hurt all the time. My knees hurt all the time. I used to be sleep standing up on the job. Like a lot of people have with sleep apnea, they get uh, headaches in the morning. They don't sleep well at night. They're waking up all the time. Um, oftentimes they'll wake up feeling like they're choking or, or not able to breathe. Then during the day, because they're not sleeping well, at night, they're drowsy. And so, uh, you know, kind of his biggest problem was he would have episodes where he'd like fall asleep during the day. I told it out of Mercedes Benz, went to sleep at the red light, and uh, when I woke up, I just hit the gas and ran in the back of somebody. I knew something was wrong with me serious then. So that's when I started trying to get my weight together. That's when I said I'm gonna do something. The physiology of sleep apnea is real important. The chemicals in your blood change and the carbon dioxide levels go up and your acid-base balance gets out of control. And then that causes other changes, which leads to high blood pressure and headaches, 
getting a correction on this problem is, is real important. And he was telling me with being that size and whatsoever, it's like carrying another person. That's why I was tired and hurting all the time. And we set up a appointment to have the surgery and I had it on April the 10th. From there, man, life changed. After discussing all of the choices with him, he thought that a, a gastric bypass would be the best for him. What it means is you take the stomach, which is a, an organ about this big, and you create a small stomach by physically dividing the upper portion of the stomach away from the rest of the stomach. You divide the intestines and, and bring up part of the intestine to that small pouch and then reconnect it farther on down. Oh, I feel great, man. I don't have sleep apnea anymore. I don't have to uh, sleep on the sleep apnea machine. I'm like one of the best workers at the job now. I'm, I'm full of energy. I'm back playing basketball, something that I love to do. I feel like a whole new person. I look like I used to look when I was in high school. It's been awesome. I, I, I can't describe it enough, man. If you've had a doctor help change your life, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. We're all different. We like different things. But one thing nobody likes is pain, especially when it keeps us from doing the things we love. Luckily, Pam is here. Whether it's back pain, carpal tunnel, foot and ankle pain, or more, PAMA physicians are dedicated to their specialties and dedicated to your quality of life. Don't let pain keep you from doing the things you love. PAMA, pain freedom. Don't forget, for more information on all the outstanding doctors you see on today's show, you head to the website, bestdocsnetwork.com. That's bestdocsnetwork.com to find one of the top doctors. Right now, it's time to head to our next best doctor. It's Dr. Rebecca Stagniak. Roger is a patient that came in immediately before Christmas. He was a gentleman in his 60s who was attempting to go to the bathroom and passed out on the floor. And when he awoke, he was paralyzed from his neck down. As it first happened, I was in and out of consciousness, but um, I, I was really frightened uh, when, when first of all, I, I couldn't move my legs or my arms. Unfortunately, when he passed out and fell onto the hard surface of the bathroom floor like a rag doll, he didn't have any support from any of his normal muscles because he was unconscious and allowed all of that really significant arthritis to really hurt the spinal cord. It was the very first time that I met Dr. Stachniak. I had never had an occasion to use a neurosurgeon. I was uh, totally impressed with how she came across as being very confident. Uh, also, uh, I mentioned earlier her bedside manners. Uh, the way she just held my hand and, and, uh, and gave me that, that feeling that it wasn't just going to be a, a business deal, but it was going to be personal. We had to reconstruct his spine from the front and the back to take away really severe um, degenerative stenosis that he had developed over the years that was totally unbeknownst to him. It was a very complicated surgery that was about five and a half hours. And after surgery, um, we had felt that everything went perfectly, but unfortunately, he could only have some flicker movements in his extremities. And I think one of the things that, um, that I wanted to happen was I, I just wanted to be well fast. And it wasn't until a couple of months after surgery that he really started to see big improvements in terms of his strength and actually starting to gain the function to be able to walk. And then as months started to progress after that, many really significant kinds of improvements started to happen fairly quickly. And then finally you get, uh, you get that courage, you get that, um, get that feeling in you that, there, you, know, that you can't beat this thing, that, that it can happen. Let's talk about your bones. Bone health is very important, especially in women. You can get osteoporosis, that's very thin bones, and also there's mildly thin bones, which we call osteopenia. Now, what causes this, and who's at risk for bone thinning? Well, generally it's females. We often see it in Asian people, as well as people with very thin bones and low weight, under 126 pounds. People with red hair, blue eyes, freckles, and fair skin, they tend to get a lot of osteoporosis and a lot of osteopenia. The way you diagnose this is through a bone 
density scan. That should be done at your doctor's office. Now, if you do have osteopenia or osteoporosis, you need to be on calcium and vitamin D. Generally, 600 milligrams of calcium twice a day and 400 international units of vitamin D twice a day. If you take it all at once, that's not going to do the trick. Half of it will go out in your urine. You must take the daily dose and split it in half, take half in the morning and half in the evening. That way it will get into your bones very well. Mohs surgery is a surgical technique for the removal of skin cancer that enables us to examine all of the surgical margins of the tissue that were removed so that we're sure that we've gotten all of the skin cancer. It has the highest cure rates of any technique of treating skin cancer and enables us to preserve as much normal tissue as possible while still removing all of the skin cancer. The technique is very much like the biopsy in that everything is done in the office. We just use a little local anesthetic, numb the area up and remove the area that we can see. The way in which it differs from the biopsy is that we take the tissue that we excise and prepare it in our lab. We make our own slides and I examine the slides under a microscope to determine if we've gotten all of the skin cancer. If we have, we stop there. If we have it, we know precisely where any residual skin cancer is. We go back just to that area, remove a little bit more tissue, make some more slides, and keep repeating that process until we're sure we've gotten all of the cancer. If the skin cancer is very small and very superficial, the wound that results from the surgery that we do may be very similar to the wound they had after the biopsy. Very often it will heal satisfactorily on its own with good routine wound care. However, if the skin cancer has invaded more deeply or is wider than what it appears to be on initial exam, then we may recommend a repair of some sort. And they range all the way from simple side-to-side -side closure to a skin flap or a skin graft. And as with all cancer, early detection and treatment is the best way to cure skin cancer. Vicki had sinus pressure with pain every day until she met Dr. Joshua James. To find out more about Vicki's story and other life-changing stories, log on to bestdocsnetwork.com. Atopic dermatitis often sort of synonymously referred to as, as eczema, even though a lot of people think eczema can be other things than atopic dermatitis. Most patients and lay people think of it as the same disease. Just sort of think of it as your skin is just too sensitive to the everyday things in the world that most normal people can tolerate without any problem. For example, when the air gets really dry, a lot of patients that have atopic dermatitis will start to break out, their skin will get itchy, they start scratching, then they get more of a rash. And in fact, a lot of people have actually referred to atopic dermatitis as the itch that rashes. If people itch first and they start scratching, their skin gets irritated, they get this red oozing, and then they end up getting secondary bacterial infections with staph and other things like that that really makes it get much worse. If someone's got atopic dermatitis or eczema, for example, they need to be treated with something to prevent it from getting worse. And some of the things we use are things like moisturizers and emollients. Uh, we want to try to, if there's any secondary bacterial infections, driving condition, we want to get rid of those by using antibacterial washes. Bleach washes are very good for that, and we now have the clean body wash that works very well because that can be used both in the bath as well as in the shower. You'll also need to use antibiotics, sometimes hopefully topical, but in some cases it may have to be oral antibiotics. And then even other ancillary things we use are ultraviolet light treatments, antihistamines, topical anti-itch preparations, even in some cases anti-rejection drugs like cyclosporin have to be used in really bad cases. Most cases do begin in childhood, but there are some cases rarely that actually begin in adulthood. The good news about atopic dermatitis is that if you develop as a child, there's a fair chance that as you get into your teenage years and a little bit older that you'll outgrow it. You may still have a tendency to have some allergies and hay fever and that sort of thing throughout your life, 
But in a lot of cases, the atopic dermatitis gets much better in the teenage years and, and in the 20s. It's also not contagious. It's not something you can spread the disease from one person to another. Now, one of the problem is, though, if a child is contaminated and, and carrying staff, that can be spread within households. It's very important that if a child is infected that they're taken care of and you try to limit that so that the parents don't get it or the other siblings don't get it because that can be a problem. As always, for more information on any of the doctors you've seen on today's show, just go to our website, bestdocsnetwork.com. That's bestdocsnetwork.com. And of course, Candace, people know that the bestdocsnetwork.com, all about doctors helping change people's lives, and that leads us to our next doctor who has helped change a number of individuals' lives. It's sports medicine and pain management doctor, Chad Stevens. A little over two years ago, I was coaching my daughter's basketball team. Didn't like the way the drill that they were doing, so I kind of uh, jumped in the middle of it and showed them how to do it. I'm not as young as I used to be. So the next morning I get up and I've got this severe back pain. And I thought, well, I just pulled and strained something that wouldn't even be deal. A month later, I'm still in pain, thinking this is just really kind of strange. And we went and had an MRI done, and it didn't show anything that they could see. Some very good doctors in the Metroplex had been taking care of him for a related problem of his hip. As I started examining him and talking with him, I realized that there was something going on in his hip joint itself. He pulls the MRI up on the computer and says, yeah, we've got some kind of uh, a tumor that had caused some weakening in the bones. Had a, there was a fracture one, there was a tumor, uh, and it was, it was an ugly mess. It's one of those hip cancers that is eating away at his pelvis and eating away at his hip and just weight bearing alone walking could cause a hip fracture, a pelvic fracture that could put him into extreme pain and extreme you know, need for surgical intervention. Here's this guy who walked in on his own and who thought, well, I'm just getting another shot like I've always gotten. And now I'm telling him, you can't put any weight on this hip. You've got to go on crutches until further notice. You really need to go to MD Anderson. This is, a, this is an MD Anderson type problem. And he did. And he went down there and he had surgery. I went and had a hemipelvectomy and that's they remove half of your pelvis out with an allograft. So they put somebody else's pelvis in me, gave me a, a hip replacement at the same time, 16 hours worth of surgery, three hours of plastic surgery. It was a pretty major ordeal. You know, he had to uh, line in for an IV so he could get his chemotherapy, lost all of his hair, lost a lot of his weight, and just went through this journey that he didn't know if he was gonna survive. I think he's the only two-year survivor of this type of cancer without a recurrence that, that's known combination of what the doctors do, you know, hats off to Dr. Stevens, taking the first step to find my problem, get it diagnosed correctly, and, and then find the proper treatment. Now he's back, family man, coach, dad, businessman, and back to himself again. Many of us live with pain, but you don't have to. Pam is here to help. Whether it's sports injuries, arthritis, or joint pain, the physicians of PAM are dedicated to your wellness and getting you back to pain-free days. So what are you waiting for? Go to PAMAinc.net and find a physician or orthopedic specialist who can help you stop pain and live life to its fullest again. PAMA. Pain freedom. Go to PAMAinc.net. Tense elbow is a very common condition. The real medical term for it is lateral epicondylitis, which is a fancy name for pain on the outside of your elbow. Uh, but tennis elbow is a form of tendonitis, usually from repetitive use. What's peculiar is that 95% of the cases usually have nothing to do with tennis or any other racket sports. It's just everyday people doing repetitive things and they get the tendonitis in their elbow. Tennis elbow can present as both a sharp pain and a chronic pain. It usually gets very sharp when they try to lift something heavy. And they'll feel that sharp pain in the elbow, which can radiate into the forearm as well. But once you get it, it can sometimes be very difficult to treat. It usually lasts for months. We try to treat it conservatively initially. We do that with special elbow straps, and a lot of times you'll see people running around with these straps around their forearms. Some are just soft straps you wrap around your forearm. Some have plastic pieces and rubber pads in them. Some have little air pockets in them. All of them serve to put a little compression on the muscle and take a little bit of tension off the tendon to try and give it a chance to heal. We also try to treat it with steroid injections, 
and anti-inflammatories and sometimes with therapy and special stretching exercises. And we'll try to do that for several months. And most of the time that works. Every once in a while it doesn't work and then we have to talk about the surgery to fix it. Now in the case of tennis elbow, the problem is, is that sometimes you get a lot of little micro tears in the tendon that just don't heal. And in order to address that surgically, we make a small incision in the elbow and we release the tendon, clean out the inflammatory tissue, and then anchor the tendon back down to the bone so that it heals as a nice solid anchor for the muscles that it's attached to. And then once you get a nice solid anchor, the pain and inflammation go away and you achieve pain freedom. After surgery, the patients are in a splint for one to two weeks, and then we start some gentle range of motion therapy. We don't really let them do any heavy lifting until six to eight weeks after surgery. But once they get through the rehabilitation process, they're able to return to normal activity with significant improvement in their symptoms. The Best Docs Network is all about doctors changing people's lives. Like our next physician, it's OB-GYN, Dr. Patrick Allen. I started having symptoms of endometriosis that we didn't know at the time was endometriosis in my very early teens uh, and hospitalized a couple of times. It wasn't until I was 18 that finally it was diagnosed as endometriosis. The glands which are inside the uterus, if they are anywhere else besides inside the uterus, that's considered endometriosis. I was a little bit trepidatious whenever I first came to Dr. Allen because I wasn't sure what to expect and, and how it was going to be. And from that very first visit, he just made me feel like I was in the right hands, that he was going to take care of me, that he was up on all the research for endometriosis and that it was going to be okay and that hysterectomy was not the answer for me, that, that there was hope for me to be able to have children. Usually if a woman starts having some of the symptoms of, the, of pelvic pain, painful cycles, painful intercourse, they'll We'll try more conservative treatment. Sometimes you put patients on oral contraceptives and it seems to keep their symptoms under control and you don't work it up anymore. It basically puts your body through a chemically induced menopause. And the theory being that if your body isn't having a cycle, the um, lining of the endometriosis uh, won't be able to be on the outside, so it won't be able to be growing as quickly. There's really two ways to treat it. You can either try to excise it do surgery, ablate it, and the other way is if you do not want to do surgery, you can do uh, one of the medicines to reduce the amount of estrogen. I use Depo-Lupron, but there's a couple of other products on the market as well. I have Zachary now. He's a five-year-old, started kindergarten this year, but even beyond that, I haven't had surgery in over five years unless you count my C-section. From the time I was a teenager until that moment, had been so that I could hold that baby, and Dr. Allen made it possible. If they get good pain relief from surgery, sometimes they want to get pregnant, I tell them, go for it. Pregnancy is a great thing for it as well. A lot of times if a patient has a baby, it seems to make a huge difference in, in how it comes back, doesn't come back for a long time. Jacob's quality of life was affected due to gastric reflux disease until he met Dr. Glenn Eide. To find out more about Jacob's story and other life-changing stories, log on to BestDocsNetwork.com. If you've had a doctor help change your life, we'd love to hear about it. Send us an email at info at BestDocsNetwork.com. I had no energy. I was limp. Uh, I just barely could put one foot in front of the other. Every day was just a difficult day to get through. All I wanted to do was just to crawl into bed. I was so tired. I was also having some heart palpitations and flutters and that was scary. I could tell something was wrong. So I went and saw Dr. Worrell. Sleep apnea is really sleep apnea with hypopneas. They're two different parameters we look at when we're doing sleep studies as far as sleep disordered breathing. There's the pause in the breathing for 10 seconds which constitutes an apneic episode. In a hypopnea, you don't breathe well enough to get proper ventilation and your oxygen level actually drops. So for people who every two minutes don't breathe well enough to ventilate their body, then we call that a severe sleep apnea. 
Severe sleep apnea is associated with various kinds of heart problems. Dr. Worrell suspected that I probably had a form of sleep apnea and uh, he prescribed a sleep clinic and it came back that I was borderline. So we waited for a little while more and did another one and finally it came back that I was full-blown sleep apnea. And they of course said, you've got to have a machine. A CPAP is kind of a necessary evil sometimes. Some people will adapt more easily than others and for those who do adapt to it, they are the ones who are the most appreciative because they see the quality of life improvement. They wake up and they're not so achy, not so stiff in the morning, that they have more energy, more stamina, that they just feel better overall. Within two weeks of getting a good night's sleep with a CPAP machine, I was back to 100%. I was like, it's a miracle. It's just absolutely a miracle. I think Dr. Worrell is probably the best doctor I have ever gone to. He partners with you for your health issues. He's not condescending. He listens and very, very gently pushes you in the right directions that you need to go for your health. When it comes to developing gynecologic cancer, Dr. Jonathan O has a few reasons how it develops. For most gynecologic cancers, they're what we term sporadic, meaning that there's no familial disposition, there's no genetic link. So about 85% will just be sporadic. But the small percentage will be hereditary. When dealing with gynecologic cancer, there are signs and symptoms to watch for that are associated with the three most common cancers. First, ovarian cancer. For ovarian cancer, the signs and symptoms are very generalized. And when I say generalized, what I mean is that the symptoms are not specific to what you would think would be gynecologic cancer. So the most common complaint that women will have for ovarian cancer is, is bloating and distension. So it's not pain, it's not any problems with, with what they feel like is their female organs, but it's just feeling bloated. Oftentimes people come in saying that they just can't eat as much, they feel full really early, uh, they feel like their, their bellies are getting bloated and their, their clothes are fitting more tightly and these are problems that just persist and progress over time. Another form of gynecologic cancer is uterine cancer, which is common among both older and younger women. The most common sign for uterine cancer is postmenopausal bleeding. So if a woman generally over 50 who's done having periods starts to have any bleeding, then she should seek medical attention because that's a very, very worrisome sign, and that's the most common sign for uterine cancer. The most common sign for uterine cancer in a young patient would be heavy vaginal bleeding. So if you have bleeding that's much heavier than your typical period and this persists over several, several weeks to several months, then that warrants a, an evaluation and biopsy. Now to the third common gynecologic cancer, which is cervical cancer. The most common symptom for cervical cancer is abnormal bleeding. And oftentimes this will present as what we call postcoital spotting. And postcoital spotting is just a fancy term for spotting or abnormal bleeding after intercourse. What will happen is that the cancer will develop on the cervix with what we call trauma, and trauma could be intercourse. It stirs the cancer up and causes it to bleed, and women will present complaining of bleeding. If you are having any of these signs and symptoms, please consult your physician. That will do it. That'll wrap up another edition of the Best Docs Network, featuring some of the best doctors in the entire Dallas-Fort Worth area. That, of course, helped change people's lives. And the good news is, if people want to find out more information about these doctors, they can head to the website, bestdocsnetwork.com. That's right. And if you have a question or comment for us, we would sure love to hear from you. Send us an email at info at bestdocsnetwork.com. All right. So long, everyone. We will see you next week. And don't forget, coming up next, it's the Best Docs Network featuring Forest Park Medical Center, right. one of the top medical centers in the entire Dallas-Fort Worth area. So long, everyone. We'll see Take you care. next week.